Our final speaker this session is Joan Palupa, uh, sorry, Dr. Joan Palupa, uh, who's a postdoc uh, with the Mortimer Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute at Columbia University. All right, so um, my true scientific love is nuclear architecture and organization. I'm really interested into how this architecture, organization, and the formation of nuclear compartments can lead to and inform differential gene expression. I'm planning to convince you all today that olfactory neurons represent an ideal system to study these questions and that through live cell microscopy, I'll be able to generate unprecedented insight into gene regulation and uh, nuclear organization. So nuclear organization can lead to changes in gene expression through a couple different ways. One of the most obvious is altering the distance between genes and regulatory elements such as enhancers or transcription factors. Nuclear organization can also lead to the creation of distinct nuclear subcompartments, and these subcompartments can have different biochemical environments which enables proteins to behave differently. This is maybe not my remote. <laughs> this is number one. OK. <laughs> Good. So to study nuclear organization in my postdoc, I joined the Lombardis Lab um, at Columbia University. In the Lombardis Lab, we study the most striking example of gene regulation by gene organization, which is receptor choice in olfactory sensory neurons. So each olfactory neuron will express one and only one olfactory receptor. And this is in order for that neuron to be able to convey useful information to the brain. The mouse genome contains about 1,400 different OR genes. They're distributed across almost all chromosomes. And fascinatingly, these ORs are expressed not only in a monogenic fashion, but also a monoallelic fashion. Shown here is a fixed mouse olfactory epithelium. In this image, all the neurons expressing a paternal allele of one particular OR are marked by a red signal, and those expressing the maternal version of that exact same gene are expressing a, a red signal, or a green signal, sorry. <laughs> so you can see from this image that cells are either green or red, but never both. So in order to have a functional mammalian nose, the biological challenge presented to each neuron is twofold. First of all, each neuron has to express a single OR out of these 2,800 different options, and then it also has to repress all the other ORs. In order for a nose to be a pretty good nose, a high diversity of these alleles need to be expressed. The answer to how neurons achieve this is not through gene, um, the DNA elements. They're all controlled by 69 similar enhancers, and they're all driven by 1,400 very similar promoters, yet still only one OR allele is, ex is expressed. This problem is solved through genome organization. Um, in a precursor nucleus, the heterochromatin, shown here in red, is found near the periphery of the nucleus. But as the cells develop, the heterochromatin forms a compact center at the center of the nucleus, and the OR genes are packaged into tight compartments at the periphery of the center. The expressed OR gene is found at the edge of one of these highly compact regions, and it's associated with a multi-enhancer hub. This, enhancer, this hub contains enhancers both from the same chromosome and enhancers from other chromosomes. Now, these trans contracts or these trans contacts are particularly interesting because they're critical for gene expression. We happen to know the transcription factors that mediate the formation of this hub. They include LHX2, EBF, and the cofactor LDB1. These interactions are essential for OR gene activation, and LHX2 in particular is also critical for the formation of the silent compartments. This system is a remarkable example of how nuclear architecture can control transcriptional regulation. Through live cell imaging, I hope to answer the question of how the formation of this hub promotes monoallelic expression in a unique subnuclear compartment. In this talk, I'm going to describe the progress I've made towards developing olfactory neurons as a system for investigating gene regulation and genome organization through live cell imaging. 
Currently, the dynamics that I'm interested in studying cannot be resolved in vivo, so I've had to develop an ex vivo culture system for primary olfactory neurons. For about 20 years, the Lombardis lab and others have tried to get a good culture system for OSNs working where the gene regulation recapitulates that found in vivo. Um, in the last few years, I've managed to uh, solve this problem and grow happy neurons. Um, if you have detailed questions, I'm happy to answer them later, but the short story is that um, we have to grow these neurons in co-culture with other specific mouse cells present in the olfactory epithelium, as well as an astrocyte feeder, feeder layer. I also supplement the, growth, the um, media with a variety of growth factors to promote their differentiation. To do this research, I'm using a mouse line that preferentially expresses a certain OR, which in our case is Ulfer 17. This enables me to design probes and tools specific for this OR. I'm gonna, again, skip the details of the system, but it's important to note that this gene is under endogenous control, and we can talk more about it later. The mouse line that I'm using has the further advantage that it has a gene activity reporter. So when cells express Ulfer 17, they also express GFP. The neuron in this image is alive. It's on my microscope. It's expressing GFP, which fills the cell body and the nucleus of the cell. The bright region at the center is the nucleus, and um, at the very center of the nucleus, you see this dark region. And this dark region is an area that the GFP cannot access. This is the heterochromatic center, which is so dense that GFP cannot diffuse into it. If we fix cells, we can stain them with DAPI, and we see a bright focus towards the center of the nucleus. This is consistent, again, with the formation of this heterochromatic center, which is a hallmark of OSNs, and our first indication that these OSNs were recapitulating the genomic organization found in vivo. You can see that the other cell types surrounding this neuron and culture do not have this distinct bright focus, and instead their heterochromatin is found near the periphery, which is much more common in mammalian cell types. Overall, the neurons grown in culture are bipolar. They appear to be differentiating properly and expressing markers of mature OSNs. Via RNA-seq, we know that their gene expression profiles match that found in vivo. And not only are these um, proteins expressing most uh, OSN markers, but they also express um, AC3. And AC3 is an enzyme necessary for odor detection. So this is an indicator that these neurons can smell. And in fact, when we um, take our Ulfer 17 neuron and express a red calcium indicator and introduce the specific Ulfer 17 odorant, we see that in fact this neuron is capable of smelling in culture. For me, the most important part was that the genomic organization of these neurons matches that found in vivo. As I mentioned before, the unexpressed ORs are sequestered into tight compartments. These compartments can be visualized with DNA fish. Shown here in pink is a probe that targets all OR genes. You can see that the um, compartments form towards the periphery of this heterochromatic center in situ. And in my culture system, the neurons recapitulate this organization. We can also visualize these interchromosomal compartments via Hi-C, which is a technique that measures the frequency at which two DNA um, elements are close to each other. Shown here is a Hi-C contact map taken from in situ OSNs. On chromosome, uh, chromosome two is found on the X coordinate, and chromosome nine is, formed on, is found on the um, Y axis. Uh, shown in pink are the OR genes and their location along these chromosomes. And the greater the signal, you see that there's more contact between these two coordinates. The arrows point to areas of close physical proximity, and you can visualize these OR compartments in high c When we look at the high c of my neurons in uh, culture, we see that we see the same pattern, showing that these interchromosomal contacts are maintained in culture. So now I have neurons expressing a specific OR in culture, which allows me to develop techniques to study the expression of the specific gene. The next step is to engineer tools to image the different components of this um, gene. And I wanted to start by visualizing the actively expressed OR in, the, uh, in living cells. In my system, this is Ulfer 17. So I can introduce guide RNAs to Ulfer 17, a DCAS9 with a, uh, that can be fluorescently labeled, and then I can show that I can image the active allele and the active allele only. Labeling this gene in a living cell means that I can 
in monitor the dynamics of the other components with respect to this gene in real time as it's being transcribed. The next step is to visualize the transcription factors, and in particular, I wanted to do so without throwing off their endogenous levels. I built a bunch of mouse lines where I can visualize both the active allele and the endogenous transcription factors simultaneously. And I can also express transgenic transcription factors at very low levels um, with lentiviruses expressing the proteins via read through error. And this keeps expression level at about 100 proteins per cell. This system has the further advantage that I can mutate the transcription factors to rapidly test hypotheses so I don't constantly need to be making new mouse lines. So having recently built and validated all these tools, I'm going to share with you today some very preliminary observations that are hot off the microscope. The first observation I'd like to share is that these transcription factors are being recruited to the active allele at higher stoichiometry than we would expect given the number of enhancers present at the allele. So we know that the about six to 10 enhancers are present at the active allele but we see way more than six to 10 fluorescent proteins at this active allele, meaning we're seeing some type of extra recruitment occurring. Shown here is a structural prediction from AlphaFold Multimer of these three transcription factors. As you can see from this structural prediction, the transcription factors are not only predicted to interact, but all contain intrinsically disordered domains. These domains are hydrophobic, which suggests that these transcription factors might be able to undergo some type of phase separation, um, in vivo, using our imaging system, I'm working at eliminating some of these interaction domains to test if I can see what is leading to this accumulation effect. Live cell microscopy will allow me to probe how the dynamics of these proteins are changing in a location-dependent manner inside the nucleus. Which leads me to the second major observation, namely that transcription factor turnover in these hubs is pretty slow. I can monitor turnover with FRAP or fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. In this technique, I can photobleach a hub and then see if the proteins in that hub are being exchanged with those loose in the cytoplasm. Thus far, I've photobleached a hub and shown that I don't see recovery within 10 minutes, which is much slower than recovery time seen in transcription factor hubs found in immortalized cell lines. This underscores the importance of doing this type of imaging in terminally differentiated cell types. The last major observation I want to share with you today is that the transcription factor dynamics look different at the active allele versus the inactive allele. So I'm currently able to perform single molecule tracking of transcription factors, shown here are tracks of LHX2. The total time step between each acquisition time is 20 milliseconds, meaning that each crick in the track is a 20, second, 20 millisecond time jump. The tracks are color coded by RMSD, with faster moving transcription factors appearing more green. I can simultaneously act, label an active allele and an inactive allele. At both the active allele and the inactive allele, we see accumulation of these transcription factors. It might be easier to see these tracks if I randomly color code them. I've begun pulling up these tracks and I see that transcription factors appear to be more stable near the inactive allele. To me, this suggests that the transcription factors may not simply ca be causing transcription, but they might also be forming a type of scaffolding protein at the inactive hub. At the active allele, we see more mobile transcription factors, but they appear to be still contained within the hub and are not diffusing in and out of the nucleoplasm. The single molecule tracking reveals the differences between the active alleles and the inactive alleles, providing location-specific information about these dynamics. By following these tracks, I'll be able to answer the question of how the same protein is behaving differently in these two subnuclear compartments, which will enable me to explain how we're getting repression of one allele and activation of another. This is all really exciting, really new, and I hope everyone here stays tuned as I begin to collect and analyze this data in earnest. Um, I hope I have persuaded you today, or well, I have persuaded you today that OSNs represent a great system to investigate genome organization and compartmentalization, as well as gene transcription factor interactions in a post-mitotic cell type. I believe that cellular imaging will allow us to characterize these transcription factor hubs and illuminate the mechanism behind their formation, as well as how the cooperative interactions within this hub allow one allele to ex ex escape repression and another one to be repressed in the same nucleus. As I move forward beyond the work I've described here today, I plan to label and 
uh, study the enhancer gene interactions, and I also plan to label the nascent RNA and explore how the RNA may play a role in this hub formation. In my future lab, I plan to develop and use new live cell microscopy techniques to study nuclear organization, both in olfactory neurons and in other cell types. I believe these techniques will provide a mechanistic insight into how nuclear organization can lead to differential gene expression in various post-mitotic cell types and in disease states. With that, I'd like to give a big thank you to the Lombardis Lab and all my funding sources. In particular, I'd like to give a shout out to my technician, Olga Staffi, who's been incredibly tenacious and patient with me as we cloned and tested half a million constructs to get this imaging up and running. <laughs> um, and also my big boss, Stavros Lombardis, who allowed me to come into his lab. It's a molecular biology lab, and I told him I wanted to do live cell imaging, and he was like, okay, sure, you do that. <laughs> so I'm very grateful that he was willing to let me come in and completely throw things out the window in, in his lab. <laughs> um, and with that, I'd like to thank you guys for your attention at this last talk of the day, and uh, open for questions. <laughs> Hi. Uh, cool talk. I wanted to uh, know if there's more known about what is the source of this global chromatin organization. That really yeah. sounds wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a fair amount characterized. Well, we know that lamin B gets de, 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 um, uh, gets uh, knocked down. Uh, Downregulated, downregulated. Sorry, my brain today. Uh, downregulated during development, which allows the um, kind of the contacts to lose um, the heterochromatin to lose its contact to the nuclear periphery. How exactly this global shift is occurring, we're not entirely sure, and that's still an active area of research and something that I think would be really cool to look at via live cell imaging. Um, yeah. Um, super cool talk. You've done so much work to get the system up and running. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, okay. Have you uh, looked at or um, been able to track any activity-inducible transcription factors? No. Um, not yet. <laughs> I've just started with the imaging because yeah, finally the yeah, tools are being no. built. But that's something I'm very interested in trying. That would yeah. be so cool. This yeah. is so applicable to so many things. Yeah, like why, yeah. a syna why a synapse even forms. Yeah, what, one of the interesting things about doing any kind of transcription factor imaging in these like post-mitotic cell types mm -hmm. is they're incredibly vulnerable to changes in levels. Mm -hmm. And so you express any, you know, any one of these transcription factors, if I come in at transgenically, everything gets thrown off. The, the nucleus completely falls apart. So they're incredibly level sensitive, which is why it was so important for me to create endogenous knock-ins yeah. and to have the kind of the fun lentivirus vector where I can just introduce about 100. And so I think, yeah, trying to have an activity inducible. Um, I have actually just cloned some like auxin degradable ones where you can kind of play around with yeah. levels more precisely. Yeah, it's definitely something that I'm interested in. Cool. <laughs> um, 